Jesus the Christ, we come. We thank you, Father God, for another chance, another privilege. We thank you, Father, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us, Father God, to seek out your word one more time. Now, Lord, Father God, we realize that you are God. And beside you, there is none other. You are the only true and the only living God. And for that, we glorify you. We magnify you. We bless your holy name, Father God, for you are God. Now, Father God, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Bless us, Father God, to hear from you on tonight. Bless our lives, Father God, that our lives will continue to roll on just a little while longer. And bless us, Father God, that we will be able to tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness that is found in your word. We ask you to bless us here tonight. Keep us in your will and bless us to walk through your word and that we will have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. So in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Where should I be? again for another privilege. Thank God again for another chance, another opportunity to dig deeper into his word. God has blessed us again and again in order that we will be able to be ministered to through his word, through the word of the almighty God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for another privilege. I'm going to tell you tonight it's a privilege. But everybody know. I want to let you know it's a privilege tonight. Everybody that's listening by way of the airways, it is a privilege tonight just to be in the presence, the presence of God. I want to look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 18. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 18. We're going to talk about prayer. Talk about prayer. It is, it is a custom for us to enter into the new year in prayer. And certainly it ought to become our custom to, to end out the year in prayer. Because God has brought us through this year and previous years. He has, he has blessed us. And regardless of how things may look, regardless of how bad things may have been, and regardless of how good things have been, we didn't do it on our own. Amen. God has blessed us. And for that reason, we ought to talk to him and allow him to talk to us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. I'm beginning right in the middle of the of a conversation here. But I want to get my point over here. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 18. He says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful, watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Thank you so much. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. Praying in the spirit. And while you're praying, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Let me begin right now with a pop quiz and ask you how many times you see the word all in this one verse. The word all, the word all. The word all is found in this verse several times, right? Tell me how many you see. You see praying always with all prayer and supplication. That's the first one. In the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance, that's the second one, and supplication for all the saints. So in one verse, we find several times the author uses the word all. So he, he makes sure that we understand that prayer is important. When you look further up, beginning at verse number 10, Ephesians chapter chapter 10, I mean chapter 6, verse number 10, 
He ends this conversation by a final word. He says, finally, brother. A final word. Sister Henry says four times. Let's see. Praying with, praying always with one all, prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And that one verse, in the New King James Version, we see three times. Other versions may show four. But in New King James, it shows three times, right? So, so the author here is the Apostle Paul, and he emphasizes the need for the saints to pray. And in this particular verse, he emphasizes the need for the saints to pray for all other saints. So as I was saying, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he begins this dialogue by putting on the whole armor of God. He says a final word, and this final word is finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of the Lord's might and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of the Lord's might. We know that many times we are strong, but we are strong in our very own might. But Paul says we ought to be strong in the Lord and in the power of the Lord's might. That says to us that we are strengthened through the Lord. God gives us power. God gives us strength. God gives us hope. Therefore, we ought to finally, he says, brethren, finally. When he says brethren, he's talking about the saints of God. He's talking about those who are saved, those who are born again. He says, finally, brethren, those of you who are called the saints, finally, brethren, those of you who are born of the Lord, finally, brethren, those of you who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and believe that that story, that story alone will get you to heaven. He says, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Goes on to say, put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, against the schemes, against the, the tricks, against the wiles of the devil. He, said, he says to us that if we're going to stand against the devil in his tricks and his schemes, we got to do it in the Lord. We got to be strong in the Lord. If we're going to be able to stand because the devil is real. So the first point tonight, you may ask, why is prayer important? The answer is because the devil is real. Prayer is important because the devil is real. Because the devil is present. Because the devil has tricks. The devil is real. The devil is present. The devil has tricks. Therefore, we need to pray. Prayer, talking to God, telling God about it. Prayer, listening to God and see what God has to say about it. We ought to spend some time in prayer. I told you before, prayer is very much neglected in our society. Not only is it neglected in our society, it is also neglected in our church. Church, a church that doesn't pray is a failing church. A church that does not pray is a failing church. A church that doesn't pray is a defeated church. A church that doesn't, pr doesn't pray becomes prey to the devil. A church that does not P-R-A-Y becomes P-R-E-Y to the devil. A family that doesn't pray becomes prey. Tyler Prater got this terrible movie out called A Family That Prays, P-R-E-Y-S. 
So we have to make sure that we pray, P-R-A-Y, in order that we do not become prey, P-R-E-Y. We must talk to the Lord. We must pray. So he says that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says the devil is real. He says the devil is present. He says the devil has tricks. Verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Why should we pray? Because we have a, a flesh and blood warfare within us, but it's a, also a flesh and blood warfare that's not within us. Let me see what I can say. I can say that a little better. In other words, the warfare that we're fighting is not a flesh and blood warfare. You know, we have flesh and blood warfares all around us. We have warfares that we're fighting in the flesh, but the greatest warfare is the one that we fight in the spirit. Now, the devil launches a warfare against us, but it's not a flesh and blood warfare. It is a warfare that is in high places. It is a warfare of the spirit. It is an elevated warfare. It is a warfare that's in the realm of spirituality. So verse 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This word wrestle means we fight. That's why I never, I never, I never wrestle on the playground. Because if you hit me the wrong way, we're gonna be fighting. I didn't play the game, I didn't play the wrestling game. Number one, I was always the smallest one out there. Number two, if you hit me the wrong way, you just made me mad. So this word wrestle that, that Paul uses here is not the word wrestle like WWE. <laughs> this is not a playing game type thing. This is an all-out war. It is a serious warfare. And if we're going to fight against the devil, we need to know, know that the devil is real, the devil is present, the devil got schemes, and the devil is subtle. He doesn't reveal himself all at one time. So he, he launches an all-out attack on us. And it is a spiritual warfare. We don't fight, we don't, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the tricks of the devil. And he's trying to defeat those of us who are saved. He's trying to tell you, even though you're saved, you are not good enough. He's trying to tell you, even though you're saved, you, re you really won't go to heaven. He has come out even in local denominations, local churches, local circumstances, and he says to all of us, you know, you can lose your salvation. Some people have come to the conclusion that you can lose your salvation based on your dress code. You can lose your salvation if you do a particular sin. The devil wants you to think you're defeated. But we have the victory through Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't fight against flesh and blood, he says. We have the protection of the Holy Spirit. We are sealed to the day of redemption. The battle is real, he says in verse 12. This is a real fight. It's not a wrestle. It's not a tussling. The devil don't tuss with us. The devil doesn't play games with us. When my little girl was small, I would take her by her head, tuck her head under my neck, wrap her arms and her legs within my arms, and I would roll on the floor with her. She would never get hurt because, you know what? We were just tussling and wrestling. But the devil is not tussling and wrestling with us. He's serious. Right. It's all out war. It's all out fight. And, and we oftentimes are fighting the wrong enemies. We're fighting each other. We're fighting the neighbor. We're fighting spouses. We're fighting friends. We're fighting the wrong enemy. This is a spiritual warfare. And the devil is out to win. 
And he will win regardless. I told you I didn't wrestle. I didn't, I didn't play those games. Because you mess around and hit me in my eye. Mm -hmm. It's over. It's a real fight. <laughs> it's shown up on. I've had my share of fights. I mean, I, 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 I used to fight going to school, fight coming from school. And not one single time in the midst of those fights did I turn into a wrestling match. Let me tell you something. I was trying to make it home alive. The devil is trying to steal our joy, destroy our spirit, and if you get a chance, he wants to catch those who are not saved and destroy their souls. It's a spiritual war, but this thing is real. So in verse 12, he says, this is a fight, this is a battle with, with cults. We're fighting against cults. We're fighting against false religion. We're fighting against pseudo-Christians. The word pseudo-Christians means that we, we got some fake Christians. Pseudo. P-S-E-U-D-O. Pseudo-Christians. Got pseudo-Christians on the bar. I told you a story before about pseudo-Christians, pseudo uh Armed masked men walked in the door with with long rifles. Walked in the church door at a particular church. Walked in and said, "Okay, everybody who's Christian, we're gonna kill you. Line up against the wall, and we're gonna kill you." The pastor and a few members lined up against the wall. The rest of the folk denied their Christianity. Or they denied that they were Christians. Or they were not Christians. The pastor and a few others lined up against the wall and said, we're going to proclaim Jesus Christ even to our parents. The rest of them refused to line up. They refused to even raise their hands and profess themselves to be Christians. So the armed men with masks on said, okay, all of you who are not Christians, you all can leave unharmed. I mean, the church just empty. All these people that were not Christians just left. All the people that didn't want to be Christians at that moment left. All those who, the, who were pseudo-Christians left. And the pastor and about nine members still in the church. Then the masked men pulled their mask off, laid down their guns. It's okay, Pastor. All the fake Christians are gone. We can really have church now. Ah, my Lord. My Lord. We can really have church now that the pseudo Christians are gone. This is a spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. It's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Mm -hmm. It's against principalities. It's against powers. It's against rulers of darkness. In of this age, against spiritual host of wicked, 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 wickedness. Evil. I mean, we're, we're not fighting against presidents. We're not fighting against governors. We're not fighting against mayors or, or judges. This is much higher than any governor can make a stand. This is spiritual warfare against the devil himself. That's why we ought to pray. It is important to pray because we are in the midst of a warfare that we can't even see going on in the natural. Because it's not flesh and blood, you can't see it in the natural. You can't even imagine it in the natural. It's not against flesh and blood. What you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch, it doesn't even exist in this warfare. It's, it's in, in principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this day and age, this time. Mm -hmm. We fight against spiritual hosts of wickedness, a whole heap of them. The powers of wickedness, we fight against it. And these powers, he says, that it's in heavenly places. High places. 
This war that's going on has been a war that's been going on for many ages. And the devil's not really after you, he's after God. And if you have God in you, he's upset with the God in you. This is a spiritual warfare. And it's above what we see. It's in heavenly places. There's a warfare going on beyond here. Ever since God threw the devil out of heaven, this warfare has been going on. And we are being used as pawns by the devil. And some of us look at the devil and say, come on, use me, use me, use me up. When we ought to be telling God, God, use us, use us, use us, we're, we're really saying to the devil, devil, every chance you get, I'm available for your use. I just hate to see members that are just used by God. Just over and over again, we're just used by God. We're just used by, by the devil, brother. I'm sorry. Used by the devil over and over again. I just hate to see the devil use us when God really wants to use us. Some phone calls I get, y'all, let me just be honest with you. I know the phone call is a wicked phone call. Before I answer it, I know it's not good news. There are folk who call themselves members. I don't hear from them until there's some craziness going on. They call themselves members of the New Beginning Church. But I, as the pastor, don't hear from them until they got some stupidity going on around them, with them, through them. And about them. Yeah. The devil is just using them. That's right. And the tragedy is the devil been using them for a long time. Mm -hmm. And they just keep letting him use them. Mm -hmm. Keep letting them use them. Keep letting them use them. So this is a wickedness in heavenly high praise. Verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. Take up the whole arm of God because the day is evil. And if you take up the whole arm of God, you will be able to take a stand during that evil day. And let me tell you a secret. We are in that day. It's an evil day. Bless you. It's an evil day. You will be able to withstand in the evil day. We're saying what? The devil and his schemes. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand. Verse 13 says, having done all to stand. Remember now, the Bible wasn't written in verses and it was not written in chapters. So what looks like a one-on sentence today to us is just Paul completing his statement. When he finishes verse number 13, he moves right into verse 14. He says, having done all you can to stand, having done all you can be able, having done all you can do to stand, guess what you need to do? Stand therefore. If you yourself have done all you can do to stand, just stand. Because when you stand, you ought to stand in Christ, not in yourself. He says, verse 14 says, stand therefore, having girded your, your waist with truth. Be about the truth. He says, stand, have some integrity about you. Have your hope in truth. It refers to the integrity there. And being truthful, it, it, it comes from the word that we get the word veracity. It's a courtroom term. The reason why some people are not witnesses, they are neither called as witnesses from the defense nor the prosecution because they don't have veracity. The reason why some jurors are not chosen is because the prosecutor and the defense attorney during that period of four dial, they are looking for veracity and truth. So jurors get kicked out because they don't show veracity. They don't show integrity. They don't, they're not a good witness. Neither are they good jurors. 
So, so Paul says to us today, whatever you do, gird your waist with truth. Have some integrity. Having put on the best, the breastplate of righteousness. Don't be a part of the evilness. Some people are a part of the evilness. Some people are part of the wickedness. God wants to use us for righteousness, but the devil is using us for unrighteousness. And as I said before, there are some people that are just being used. Never use me until you use me up. It is the picture of a young person, and now some old people, that climbs up fool's hill and keep bumping their heads. They're climbing up fool's hill, and they still don't learn the lesson. You can advise them, you can talk to them, you can pray for them, but until they get the lesson deep down in their spirit, they still don't get it. And I begin to ask the question, didn't you make this mistake six years ago? Didn't you make this mistake six months ago? He says, whatever you do, make sure that you have on the breastplate of righteousness. Practice that which is right. Don't get caught up in unrighteousness. It is the picture also of, of people, to, uh, adults being t being in the midst of a conversation with a young person and saying to that young person, don't hang out with the wrong crowd. In this case, the Apostle Paul says, don't hang out with unrighteousness. He's saying, have your breastplate of righteousness on. And we can talk about each one of these separately, and we can go into great detail about what he's talking about when he talks about truth, when he talks about righteousness. But we don't have that, that ability tonight because we're stopping at verse 18. He says, in verse, verse 15, he says, In having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, put on the gospel of peace. Be a peacemaker. And if you're going to be a peacemaker, you got to do it through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be, be someone who stands out and have peace on their heart. Have a firm foundation. When you talk about having feet shod, your feet covered, your feet stuck within the, the shoes, every soldier needs to have the preparation in the right foundation. You need the gospel, and the gospel brings about peace. The gospel is a firm foundation. The Christian stands on this gospel. Every Christian soldier is, is using this gospel and he's defeating the devil by spreading the gospel. We ought to spread the good news. We ought to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We ought to tell men, women, boys, and girls that Jesus died, buried, rose, from the dead, and he can change your life. Dorothy Steele in my, my 11th grade class was very clear. She says, you don't have to keep living the way you're living. You got to take on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then she, she proceeded to deliver the gospel in my hearing. And that gospel is good news. Verse 16 says, above all, taking on the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Who's the wicked one? The devil. He has schemes. He has fiery darts. He has wiles. And you will not be able to quench the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil, the fiery darts of the devil without faith. Trusting God for what you don't see. Can you trust him for what you don't see? I've said this several times. And I say again tonight. If our church is not going to walk by faith, we might as well close the doors. Put club on the outside of the door. Take the new beginning sign down and go to hell in style. 
Every church has to walk by faith. Every church member has to walk by faith. In order to quench the fiery darts, you see the devil is shooting darts at us. And it got fire on it to give us. It's a fiery dart. It's a flame. He says, if you're going to quench the fiery darts, the flaming arrows that penetrates, we got to make sure that we are fireproof. In, in the chemical plant, we, we wear what is known as FRCs. It's, it's not fireproof, but it's called fire, fire retarding clothing. Where if you're trapped in a fire, this clothing is supposed to keep the fire off of you as long as you're in this suit. What he's saying to us today is that you need to make sure that you have fire, fire retardant clothing. FRCs that protect you against these fiery darts. He says there are flaming arrows being shot at you. And you cannot Fight these flaming arrows on your own. You need Jesus. He says, whatever you do, in order to fight these fire darts, you got to have faith. And if faith is not just believing today and forgetting about it tomorrow. Faith is walking with God on a daily, hourly, minutely, secondly, momently basis. And I'm not, I'm not just talking about faith that everything's going to be all right. I'm talking about this spiritual warfare that's going on. You have spiritual faith in the midst of the spiritual warfare. Right. Stop fighting the wrong enemy. He says that the enemy is the wicked one. It's amazing to me how people all of a sudden come to the conclusion that the man or the woman that, that they marry is the wicked one. Now, this is the same one that you had Google eyes for. This is the same one that you celebrated with. Because you can't fight against something that's not real. The devil is real. And the devil influences others. The devil even influences the believer. I said influences. He can't dwell in us because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. What did I just say? The Holy Spirit dwells within every believer. And because the Holy Spirit dwells within every believer, believer, the devil can't dwell in us. Because he can't dwell where the Holy Spirit lives. So if you're saved, if you're born again, the devil can't dwell in you. He can't possess you. You can't be demon possessed. Well, preacher, why, why church folk and why Christian people act so crazy? Because they are influenced. The devil has a way of influencing you. He says you need faith to fight against the fiery darts of the evil one. Against the arrows that he's shooting at you. With fire on it. That to burn you up. To set you aflame. He's, he's influencing Christians all over the world. But when you walk in faith, he has not that influence. When you walk in faith, when you're saved and you walk in faith, he can't dwell within you. He can't overthrow you. Lady said to me, I'm going to voodoo you. All I need is a picture of you. So wait a minute, baby, let me give you two of them. Matter of fact, let me give you a third one. Let me give you a picture of me. Now that we got internet, pictures of us are all over the world, right? right. And if somebody was going to voodoo you with a picture, they, they got plenty of them. Mm -hmm. But when you're in Christ Jesus, the power within you is greater than any power without you. Right. Or outside of you. There's a power within us. There's a person within us. The person is the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ himself. And because he's there, he has already evicted the devil. Now, if you've been evicted, do you think your landlord is going to keep letting you come back? 
You've been evicted. Go on, go on, go on, go on with me. The devil been evicted. Well, why do you keep acting like you were acting before the devil was evicted? Stop letting the devil influence. Stop letting the one who possessed you that no longer possess you influence you. It's a spiritual warfare. Stop fighting the wrong people. People are fighting their bosses. It's a spiritual warfare. People are fighting employees. This is a spiritual warfare. People are, are fighting other denominations. It is a spiritual warfare. And he says to us, we need faith in this warfare. Verse 17, and take on the helmet of salvation. You need to be born again. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. And, and I, I often wonder why Paul would put the helmet of salvation at the end, near the end, when I thought, now if I was writing it, but it, God didn't choose me to write it. I would tell you up front, you need to be born again. He says, put on the helmet of salvation. Every soldier was protected. His head was protected by his helmet. And it also made him look taller and more impressive. The helmet, the helmet sitting on the head would put the enemy at bay because he saw a guy coming toward him that was much taller more impressive in this warfare let me tell you you can't impress God nor the devil if you're not born again All right, man. you need to be saved mm -hmm. you need to be saved you need to be born again you need to put on the helmet of salvation this word Salvation is our defense mechanism. It is designed to protect us. It protects us in our heart. It protects us in our mind. It protects us in our deeds. It protects us in our walk, day to day, to day living. You can look at people and, and just about, you know, you don't know who's saved, but you can, you can just about get, get, a, get a real good idea. But saved, saved people are growing. Saved people are progressing. Saved people are acting like they're saved. He says, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. And what is the sword of the spirit? The word of God. The sword of the spirit. We need God's word. God's word in us makes us who we are. We need God's word. This word needs to be spoken. This word is our offensive weapon. The word of God is our offensive word, weapon. Don't leave home without it. It's your offensive weapon. The breastplate of righteousness is defense. The helmet, defense. But the offensive weapon is the word of God. This, this is the word, the word of God. The, the devil came up to Jesus and every time he came to Jesus, Jesus spoke the word of God. What should we be speaking? God's word, the word of God. And as we speak God's word and we live out God's word, the devil has to understand that we are fighting. And this is our offensive weapon. That means that we are no longer sitting and taking attacks. We are advancing toward him. People say, devil, you ain't got no place here. Get out of here. Offensive word. And if you tell the devil that he has no place and you never use the word of God, he is not condemned. He's not impressed. He is not, he is not one who's going to move back. He's not intimidated. He is only intimidated by God's word. If you're on the office, you have given God's word. The sword of the spirit. Some preachers even try to stand and preach without the word. <laughs> now, yeah, you can preach. You may know the word and preach, but what I'm saying is, 
when you're, when you're preaching, when you're teaching, you ought to preach and teach from God's word. God's word. Not Ebony, not Jet, not the internet. Some people pull up Google to get a message. And they come to the conclusion everything is true on the internet. But what they forget is that human beings put that stuff on the internet. And human beings are flawed. God's word is not flawed. It never contradicts itself. And those who say that it contradicts themselves is because they are taking it out of context and content. Whoo! Good God of mine. The, the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit. The this God's word. It is a sword. The soldier's sword was one that was offensive. It was a part of the believer's armor. It was our weapon of advancing. It is the whole word of God. It is a Bible. It is a specific word for a specific situation. It is a specific word for right now. And when you're using your weapon, you have to use your weapon at the right time for the right situation. You know, uh, they, they used to, people don't do it very much anymore, but they used to teach children when they sit down to eat and they pray over their food, they used to teach children to say a scripture. When you pray, they teach you to say a scripture. Lazy folk will say Jesus wept. Why do lazy folks say, and why do I call them lazy, first of all? It's just, some, just something they say. Lazy people will say every time, Jesus will. Now, let me ask you a question. What does eating your food, blessing your food, has to do with Jesus weeping? It's just a short verse, and we just want to please mom and dad and big mom and big daddy. We're going to tell Jesus will. We have to use the word of God for particular situations that we are going through at a particular time. It must be specific to the situation. Now, God, you said it. So we have to pray over the word and pray the word. A church that doesn't pray is a failing church. A the church that doesn't pray is a defeated church. A church that doesn't pray is a dying church or already dead church. See, he says, he says to us that we need to use God's word in verse 18 in our finish. He says, pray always with all prayer. Praying always. What is prayer? Talking to God. What is prayer? Talking to God and allowing God to talk to us. It always puzzles me when, when you advise a person by way of the word of God and you tell the person what the word of God says and you have the right content in the right context. And then they'll look at you and say, okay, I'm going to pray about it. What that says to me is they already have their mind made up. It also says to me is that they are not going to take your advice. And then and thirdly, it says to me, they're not going to follow God's word. If God's word says it, what is their prayer about? It's, it's like pastor says, okay, we're going to move. We're going to purchase some more chairs, move some chairs forward. We'll purchase more chairs and put them back there. And one of the persons said, I don't think we need to do that. We need to pray about it. <laughs> pastor says, well, we got folks standing in the hallway every Sunday. What is their prayer about? We're going to move the chairs what, that we have now. We're going to move them forward. We're going to purchase 20 more, 25 more chairs. We're we'll going to put them in the back so we can have everybody in the same room together. The member says, we need to pray about that. That's a, a pseudo-Christian with false faith. 
in false humility. What they're saying is, we got to pray about it so it make them look holy. But the fact of the matter is, what is, what is in the word, we don't have to pray about it. We pray over it. We pray God's word. We tell God what God has said in his word. And we don't even have to remind God, but we tell God what God has said in his word. Not only do we tell God what God has said, then we pray over the word. We pray over the word. God, your word says, and Lord, as I read and study your word, I ask you to reveal your word unto me. We pray God's word. We pray over God's word. He says, praying always. Praying when? All the time. The thing about it is, if we have a good relationship with God in prayer, we don't have to go looking for God when we're in trouble. Good God Almighty, y'all are not saying anything here tonight. If we have a constant fellowship with God through prayer, if we have a good relationship with God through prayer, we don't have to go looking for God when trouble strikes. We can say, God, here I am again. I was here two minutes ago. Here I am again. Lord, I'm asking you to bless him in Jesus' name. I'm asking you to distract, to move, to extract in Jesus' name. He says, praying always, praying every chance you get, praying without ceasing, without prayer, the armor of God is incomplete. Without prayer, the world will be no more. Without prayer, the armor in the world will be defeated. Without prayer, the armor has no use. Without prayer. Prayer has been so neglected, it has been neglected even among the saints. Let me tell you, we got to pray. Church, we have to pray. Amen. If we have not come to the conclusion that we need to pray over the last 24 months, we're not going to pray. If you have hit rock bottom and have gotten sick as you can be and have seen 800,000 people in the United States alone dying from one disease, the same disease, and you're not in prayer, you're not going to pray. Right. Right. Got to pray. Over 300, nearly right at the borderline of 300,000 people in the United States alone being being positive, tested positive every single day yes, yes. and we're not praying, we're not going to pray. Is wrong. We, we've gone from when, when the peak of the pandemic last year this time was 50,000 mm -hmm. and now we've gone from 50,000 to 300,000 mm -hmm. and that's not to even calculate those who are self-testing themselves. And we still won't pray. We are neglectful in prayer. He says, praying, verse 18, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, praying how often? Always. And he says, look at this word, all. With all prayer. He said, we ought to be praying with all prayer. And he says the supplication. In other words, we ought to show enough be praying. When you pray with supplication, that's intensity. That's like right now, God. I mean, you get to a point where you realize, God, if, if you don't help me, I can't make it. The, the old, old 100, old Dr. Watson, we used to sing back home and say, if the Lord doesn't help me, I can't stand the rain. If the Lord doesn't help me, I can't take the pain. If the Lord doesn't help me, I ain't going to make it. God is going to have to deliver me from this. Have you ever been there? Where you knew your money couldn't get you out? Because I know from, from, from 
I know as a living testimony, it's not hard to, to chalk up a million dollars worth of medical bills. Chemo treatment. It's not hard. $50,000 every visit. It's not hard. It's not hard. You have to get to a point where you realize that it's a spiritual warfare. Yes. And in the spiritual warfare, we have to pray to the point where we know and others know that we're depending on the Lord to help us. That's right. That's right. I'm depending on the Lord. I am too. Matter of fact, I'm depending on the Lord to put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> More now than ever before. <laughs> I'm depending on the Lord to be able to put one foot in front of, I'm depending on the Lord. And it's, it's clearer to me now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm depending on the Lord to wake up in the morning. That's right. Mm -hmm. But in case I don't, if I don't wake up in the morning, the, the, the 100, the, the, the hymn says, if I don't wake up in the morning, everything will be all right. He says we have to get to a point where we pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, a fellow tried to tell me that praying in the spirit was praying in tongues. <laughs> praying in the spirit is praying with specific stuff in mind as the Holy Spirit leads you. Praying with things in, in your mind. It, you know, there are general prayers. He says with all prayer, that's a general prayer. With supplication, that's with intensity. Praying in the spirit means you got to be specific with the Lord. That's right. And the only way for us to be specific with the Lord is that the Lord leads us. Yes. If the Lord doesn't help me, I can't stand the rain. I can't stand the pain. I can't go. I can't make it any further. In the spirit, the spirit. You notice the word spirit is, is capitalized. This is the Holy Spirit. He's intelligent. He's the third person of the triune God. He's an intelligent being. He leads us. He directs us. He teaches us. Then he says, not only do you pray, but you have to perform. Look there. He says, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. He says, being watchful. It's not enough for us to pray, but there come a time when we need to perform. There ought to be a time where prayer leads us into performance. Well, Pastor, I'm going to get it together sooner or later. Well, it's time to do it now. <laughs> well, God, I promise you, in, in this New Year's resolution, God is saying, you promised me last year for, the, for this year's resolution. <laughs> and it's so amazing to me how even the false prophets of the day will say, oh, this is the year of Jubilee. God is going to show enough shower down his blessings. He's going to set you free. The first thing I said, I thought you said last year was the year of Jubilee. <laughs> this is the year of Jubilee. Yeah, you're right. If you started 50 years ago and you counted back forward, yeah, it is the year of Jubilee. See, because in the year of Jubilee, all your debts are free. Your family is healthy. God is blessing like never before. And it's a good thing when God blesses like never before. And yeah, it is the year of Jubilee. We ought to be jubilant. We ought to rejoice. But God does not have to wait 50 years for us to be blessed of him. Being watchful to this end. In other words, after you pray, you look for the blessing. And he says, being watchful to this end with all perseverance. This word perseverance means patience. You got to be patient and wait on these things. God is not our bellhop. God is not our errand boy. We have to have all perseverance, meaning that we need to trust God and be patient with God. 
And there's that word again. And supplication. We have to supplicate. We, we have to go through some things. We have to pray with intensity. We have to pray with intensity. We have to pray with a, an end in mind. Patience. Waiting on God. And it's okay for us to ask God for what we want, when we want it. But we're spending more time asking God right now, God, than we are being patient with God. How many of you have been praying for something? Over and over and over again, you're still waiting on God. Still waiting. Do you just quit on God? No, you just know. throw your hands up and, and ball your fists up at God? You got to be patient. Got to be patient. Patient with God. He says, having all perseverance, being patient in, patient in your prayers. Patient with God. Can you be patient with God? Yes. The reason why we can be patient with God is because he is God. That's right. And he knows what we need and we don't know what we need. That's right. So we're patient with him and all we do, we are persevering, meaning that we're hanging in there. Mm -hmm. We're making sure that God is the God who, make, who, who does all things well. We're making sure that we trust that God. Can you trust him with yes. perseverance? Yes. Can you keep pushing through it and have patience with him? Amen. God wants us, he, God wants us to keep praying, saints. Mm -hmm. He says he wants you to pray with all perseverance. Look at these words. This word all, all just keeps showing up. All, all. He wants you to pray with all perseverance. In other words, all of your patience. In other words, lean on him. In other words, stretch out on him. In other words, trust him. With all perseverance. And with all supplication. When you supplicate, boy, I mean, you really let God have it. I mean, you really give it up for God. When you supplicate. With all perseverance. With all supplication. You feel it deep down within your bowels when you trust in God. When you supplicate for him. You got to trust him. Can you trust him? Yes. Will you be patient with him? Yes. Will you persevere? Will you push through? And keep pushing even though it doesn't show up right now. You keep pushing through. Prayer. Prayer is important. The church ought to know that prayer is important. Finally, he says, in Ephesians 6, 18, he says, whatever you do, continue to pray always. Pray with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end, being watchful. In other words, the devil is as a roaring lion. You got to be watchful. This word watchful means to be on alert. Oftentimes, I, I, I see Christians that just jumping through the tulips. They just they just think things happen the way they happen. We live in a, in a dark and dismal world right now. That's why we don't allow women to walk out of church by themselves. We're alert. We're watchful. We know the devil is real. I told you before. The devil is real. The devil is present. The devil has tricks. The devil has wives. Wows, W-I-L-E-S. The devil has tricks and the devil has fiery darts. And here Paul says, be alert. And for the preachers, you got to be on the wall. Watch, you got to be a watchman on the wall. Not only do you watch for yourself and your household, you got to watch for everybody else. Right. And I say again, I'm responsible for everything that goes on in this campus, do it or bad. Everything. That's why I can't let other folk get me in trouble with God because of what they want to do. Isn't that something? That's right. People who don't want to follow the word of God wants to get the leader in trouble with God and then they go about their business, go somewhere else and do their own thing. And the Bible is saying we as Christians must be watchful. 
must be alert. It says be watchful to this end. In other words, what you've been praying about, you look for the blessing, and what you've been praying about in the midst of your prayer, make sure you're still watching for the evilness of the devil. That's about putting on the whole arm of God, but being watchful to this end. Praying that God blesses you in the midst of it. When I was doing uh, evangelism in Third Ward, and we went out on the street and doing street preaching, we prayed with our eyes open. Why? Why y'all think we prayed with our eyes open? We didn't get down on our knees and pray. We were watchful. When you look at the, the life of Gideon, Gideon, he ended up with only 300 men. And these men were those who, who lapped like a dog, who, who looked up and around, and they licked their water like a dog. But those who got down and just, 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 just began to drink water, they didn't see anything around them. God says we have to be watchful. Have you ever wondered why I sit sideways in the church? Anybody ever thought about that? Have you ever wondered why everybody's facing the pulpit but me? Because it's easier for me to see if I'm facing the pulpit, right? I don't have to look to the side, right? But I sit sideways because I'm the watchman on the wall. Have you ever noticed that I'm, I'm pretty close to the center aisle every Wednesday night where I can see right out that door? Why is that? Because I'm the watchman on the wall. And let me tell you something. If Sister Hughes had to come in the next two seconds, we were going to start having, having Bible set on the parking lot. Because now I'm concerned. I saw when she got out of the car, she walked around the back of the car, she got something out of the passenger side, and then she stood out there too long. I'm the watchman on the wall. And I'm standing here, I'm saying, she's taking too long. I'm saying, she's hanging out on it. She needs to get her stuff together before she get out of the car. I'm the watchman. I got to see what goes on. The Bible teaches that we have to be watchful with all patience, all pressure, and we have to persevere and push through with all supplication for the saints. Look at how he ends this thing. He ends verse 18 saying, we got to do it on behalf of the saints. We got to pray on behalf of the saints. We have to have patience on behalf of the saint. We have to trust God on behalf of the saint. We have to put on our whole arm of God on behalf of the saint. God has blessed us so we can bless others. That's right. But there are some people who think that everything God has blessed them with is just for them to live happily ever after. But he says, press a fear for the saints. Look out for do what you do to benefit the saints. We are believers. Why don't women in this in this church walk up the steps by themselves? Let me tell you something. I've tripped over these steps myself, and I don't have heels on. And then some of our women are over 18. We got to look out for the saints. That's all I'm saying. What Jesus did over 2,000 years ago is looked out for us. He died on Calvary, buried in a borrowed tomb, rose from the dead. He was looking out for us. And now he says to us, we have to look out for the saints. Amen. Amen? There may be somebody who's listening who's never confessed Christ as their personal Savior. This is your moment. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. I had to come. I mean, I was weary, wounded, and sad. I was messed up and torn up. Let me just share with you. You ought to try Jesus. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. If you've never tried Jesus Christ, you ought to try him. Believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, he died on a star hill called Calvary. That he was buried in a marble tomb. But earlier that third day, he rose from the dead. If you can trust him today, you can be saved and you can guarantee yourself a spot in heaven. Will you just join me in prayer and invite Jesus into your life? Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. 
I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe that if you pray this prayer, you're now born again. And we believe that when you die, you go to heaven. Go ahead and join yourself to a good Bible teaching church where Jesus Christ is the center of attention and main attraction. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the main attraction, the center of attention. Inbox us and let us know that you received Christ tonight. Inbox us and let us know you want to be a part of this great church in Southeast Houston. You can be a global member or a local member. We'll be glad to have you. It is now often time, it's time for us to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. You can give in two ways. You can give by our P.O. Box. Our P.O. Box is New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. During our prayer time, we're praying for Nichols, 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 the grandson of Vivian Azahar. We're praying for Pastor Bartholomew Orr the Brown Baptist Church, and the family of us, Pastor Bartholomew Lord, we're lifting them before the Lord. Father God, we thank you now, we bless your name. We thank you for this privilege of giving. We thank you for blessing us. Lord, we ask you to bless and be given up. In Jesus' name, amen and thank God. You can come now and bring forth your gift, and you can stay here for prayer. And we go for the Lord and prepare for our choir to come to rehearse. Stand where you are and come and bring forth your tithes and offerings and sacrifices again. Thank you that we know that as we put on the whole arm of God, we must continue in prayer. Bless us as we pray. We pray now, Father God, for Nicholas. We pray that you bless him and heal him and keep him. Give him wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Bless him and get to know you in a very real way. We pray for Pastor Bartholomew Orr. We pray for his family. We pray for healing. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless Lord, we thank you for those who have come. We ask you to bless us as we prepare and as we look forward to serve and to sing unto you. Bless our choirs that come, that they will not just rehearse, but they, Father God, will celebrate Jesus Christ even on tonight. So in Jesus' name we pray and we ask God. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join each other by saying, amen. amen, amen. We are uniting the church, we're strengthening the families, we're supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, in I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Thank you and God bless you.